Okay, so we uh, began last week, uh, as I said, uh, we began last week with the, looking at the context, the background, uh, the historical setting uh, of the time that Jesus was born. At the same time, we wanted to understand John within context of what was taking on in the world. So without going into any more review, we will uh, launch out into John's gospel, how it begins, how he starts. And it begins in, in, uh, by saying, he starts his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Each of the, gosp each of the gospels begins in a different way. John's gospel begins with this statement, this opening statement, which was like a comet blazing across the, the night sky. It signaled the arrival of this great personage who was to change the world forever. The declaration that the divine Logos, the word of God in the person of Jesus, uh, was, was, uh, had come was a, was a direct threat to the world powers, to those who were uh, trying to keep control or have power over the region of the people in Palestine at the time that Jesus was born. It was also, we see it was a direct threat to the balance of power that was between these different uh, competing groups, which we looked at last week. Before all was said and done by the Son of God, he was going to upset this balance of power, not only just in Palestine, but over the entire world. As John would say, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, <clears throat> but of God. So in this first chapter of John, we're seeing uh, something developing here. He's de he, he's wa he wants to tell a story. And as he's telling the story of Jesus, he's taking a, a particular direction through that as he is crafting this with the, again, this is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is, this is not just John making things up as he goes along. So, but uh, we looked last week at this word and what it means. Uh, this is a, a particular form of rhetoric where one uses, speak, speaks truth to power. It's about uh, free speech or, or going, going through and and, and con directly confronting lies and propaganda, whatever you might say, that these are the things that, that uh, were, were uh, holding people in bondage. And John, uh, though he was made, probably was not conscious of what he was doing, his gospel narrative was employing a narrative style that the Greeks called Parisia, Par Parisia or in modern English, speaking truth to power. Now, sometime during the 20th century, uh, people began to recognize this or understand this, this uh, idea and were applying it in different ways. Uh, certainly in the, in the last century, there were four great examples of this that we saw. And this is a, a, a who these these men they 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 spoke boldly and frankly and freely against the oppressive governments in which they they were and although they were all from vastly different backgrounds and they all had vastly different stories and times and places where they lived they all had one thing in common and that they acknowledged Jesus Christ as the master of speaking truth to power and the inspiration for their for their uh, tactics 
that they that they use to uh, to challenge the the power structures that were around them. So uh, we see in this opening statements, John was throwing down a gauntlet that would challenge uh, a gauntlet that would challenge Rome and the Sanhedrin and the Hellenists who were represented the world powers at that time, or the, the, these, these powers that were over Roman Palestine. And so Jesus Christ, the eternal light of the world, was presented, was, was one who was born uh, of the, not of the self-willed mind of man as the Greek, Greek philosophers were, but he is the eternal and the supreme power over the earth. He did not receive his authority by the will of men, like the appointed Roman governors or the Roman officials that were backed by legions of soldiers. Jesus was, is the final authority over the religious uh, leaders, the Sabbath laws, the oil, or, oral traditions that the Pharisees equated with Mosaic law. So all those who believe in his name, Jesus, are born of the Spirit. That's what John is saying. Meaning they are liberated from the darkness of oppression and basking in the freedom of his light. Freedom in Christ is not secured by the bloodline of, of Abraham and Isaac and, and Joseph. It's not comes from a particular bloodline. It doesn't come from a particular religious belief. It does not come from any worldly power, earthly power. But those who are liberated in Christ, they are liberated uh, spiritually, mentally, uh, and completely liberated. For three and a half years, Jesus' public ministry was a dynamic example of nonviolent tactic of speaking truth to power. He received or he spoke against the received wisdom of the Jewish traditions, these Jewish traditions that were used uh, to, to have this religious legalism that kept people in bondage and under control of the religious leaders. The Roman officials used the principle that might makes right. They had their legions, they had their, they had their armies to back up their their power. The Herodians uh, had the uh, authoritarian uh, idea, ideocracy or aristocracy, and that they believed that the, uh, that the power was derived from the idea of man being the measure of all things, from the Greek philosophers, meaning that individual human being, not God or any un unchanging moral law, is the ultimate source of their truth and their reality. That they live by. So I'll combine these these despotic regimes or powers. They all they represent all the regimes that have ever existed and ever and even exist even to this day. We can look around us, and we can we can see that religious uh, religious legalists or totalitarian states, police states different governments, uh, un, unelected bureaucrats or, 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 or aristocrats, they always use their power to try to control people. And uh, it was, it's been the same. But one thing that we have to understand, what John is pointing out, what Jesus was pointing out through his teachings, which we will see throughout this gospel, is that they, they are controlled. These powers are controlled by the principalities and powers of darkness and heavenly places that, came, that Jesus came to set us free from those. So it's like in Ephesians chapter 6, when we're reading about the armor of God, and when you uh, look at the beginning of that in verse 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And therefore, as we, we see that behind everything that's taking place, even in our world today, that 
that on the when you look beyond the surface level of things, there this is a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle that's taking place between those who would keep human beings in bondage and those and, and Jesus who came to set us free from that bondage. So there, there are a lot of uh, uh, theologians that say that Jesus Christ was the first nonviolent revolutionary who ever lived, and he's presented as a prototype for every nonviolent revolutionary that came after him. You know, he's presented as a as a zealot, uh, as a as a political zealot in some uh, by, by some of these men, but he was no zealot in that sense. He was. Uh, he, he did not come uh, to incite uh, people. Those who promote Jesus as some kind of uh, Jewish zealot uh, who, protect, who proclaim the kingdom of God uh, to, as a means to overthrowing the powers that be really don't understand him, and they don't understand his teachings. He did not ride into Jerusalem like a conquering king. He didn't come in there at the head of an army. Uh, with his armed uh, followers ready to pull down uh, the uh, people in power there. That's not what he came for. His teachings were never a call for regime change uh, to end the, the Roman hegemony over Judea and to replace the corrupt, oppressive, uh, uh, arist uh, aristocratic priesthood. He was no revolutionary in a modern sense of the world. He did not come to cause any radical social upheaval to replace the old world order with a new one. That's not what he came for. That was not what he was about. He, uh, from the very beginning, John makes it very clear that the kingdom Jesus preached is not an earthly kingdom, but is a heavenly one. Most of John's first chapter is the Baptist witnessing or his witness to the coming truth, which would be incarnate in Jesus Christ. So Jesus was far beyond any kind of a, a, a political figure or a religious figure in the, in the, in the, in the uh, sense of the word that we would use today. But he came as the son of God, as the light of the world, as the true light that came to enlighten every man. And it was through this enlightenment that men are set free, that we are set free. This is what John the Baptist came to bear witness of so that all would believe in him. John continues that, that, um, that Jesus, he said that Jesus was uh, not uh, excuse me, that uh, John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives to every man coming into the world. So the idea that John the Apostle records here would have been offensive to the Greeks, uh, who thought that they were the enlightened ones, that man, that their science, man's science, their philosophy, the, their uh, idea of, of, of enlightenment was, was, was bringing light to the planet. The greatest, you know, we, we know even to this day that the greatest scientific achievements often turn out to be double-edged swords. When uh, these, um, these technological advances or scientific advances, which are promised to liberate us, often turn back to bite us and are often used against, against people rather than liberating them. They're used to control them and to oppress them. And we see how various governments uh, will, will use these technological advances not to enlighten or to lift mankind up, but to kill, to maim, and to enslave those they were supposed to lift out of ignorance and poverty. So humanistic philosophies, the philosophies of men have done more to confuse and confound people, those who are seeking truth and bring clarity. In a postmodern world, the world we live today, it seems as that all search for transcendent truth 
has been uh, has been lost. It's been uh, pushed aside, and and now uh, this idea uh, we the whole Western world is descended into nihilism and relativism and subjectivity, and this the shining lights of the Greeks man-centered philosophies turned out to be mirages that led Western cultures deeper into the, the wilderness where civilizations die from thirst and, and uh, man's religions fail to bring enlightenment because those who create and maintain them often turn violent, believing that their truth justifies force to make everyone conform to the truth that they say is absolute. And there's so many examples of this all around us today as we see how these things fail to liberate mankind. And it is only the gospel, the light that Jesus Christ came, the light who is Jesus Christ, that truly brings enlightenment to every man. And so we see how uh, this... Um, John and, and chapter 1, 10 through 14 that these are universal in scope. John, from the very opening sentence or the very opening verse of his gospel, we see how it is, it is a universal message that he is delivering. And so he says uh, in 10, 14, he was, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we can, we can see that in the end, that uh, man's religions will fail to bring him enlightenment uh, because those who create and maintain them cannot, uh, cannot bring this kind of liberation. We see that to this very day, the worldly wise and powerful who live by their own self-interest cannot comprehend Christ. His own people, the Jews, are still diligently searching their scriptures so that they might know the Messiah when he comes. And yet they are oblivious to the fact that their ancestors missed him in his first incarnation 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ was and is the firstborn of all creation, but neither Jew nor Gentile could receive him. See, because no religion could conjure him, no philosophy could perceive him, and no political force could restrain him. Only those who are humbly born of God by faith in his only begotten son can behold him. And so we begin in, in John's gospel, he begins to introduce us to John the Baptist. And of course, John the Baptist is a key figure, a key individual in all four of the gospels. They all four mention John, and John is so important because John the Baptist's ministry is essential to the gospel narratives because he is the first one, he is the first one of countless multitudes to follow that bore witness to Jesus as the Son of God. So John straddles both the Old Testament and the New Testaments like this giant colossus. And yet Jesus said of, of them, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than, than he. So John was, the, uh, as I said, John was the last of the great Old Testament prophets and the first of the New Testament prophets. His execution was a foreshadowing of the coming execution of Jesus Christ. But only Christ, the Lamb of God, could take away the sins of the world through his substitutionary, substitutionary sacrifice. So John's ministry at the Jordan River uh, is in, important for a number of reasons, and we're not going to go into, we can't go into great detail into John the Baptist ministry, ministries in this, in this particular lesson, but we see that his, uh, 
ministry immediately draws the attention of the members of the Sanhedrin. They responded by sending a delegation to interrogate John. And we see that in, uh, in verses 19 through 28 of this, of this um, chapter. But uh, John knew what was on their minds. And when they asked him, who are you? They, they really wouldn't know what, are, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the uh, claiming to be the Messiah that, it's been, that, that everyone was waiting to, to see? And uh, he told them he was not the Messiah. He was not the Christ. He was not the anointed one that they were looking for. John, John's ministry of baptism and with his sermons on repentance from sin and cleansing for, uh, for purity of the heart, they were drawing large crowds. And so they were, they were drawing the attention of, of the religious leaders at, at the very least. And so he was proclaimed that he was merely the voice of one crying in, in the wilderness saying, make straight the way of the Lord. So John's ministry was preparing the people and preparing the nation for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Jesus Christ. The priest and the Levites had come from Jerusalem to question John the Baptist and to listen to his, to his messages. Uh, they were not content uh, to hear John just to give a simple denial that he was not the long way to deliver. So they pressed him further. They said, well, okay, if you're not the, if you're not the Messiah, then are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And again, he answered no, because of course, uh, they were the, the Elijah was said to come back from the dead uh, when the Messiah would come. So John's denials really left the Jewish delegation rather perplexed about what was happening and who this figure was and what he was about. But then at that moment, John tossed them a verbal bomb shell in the midst of them when he said, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you, you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. To loose. So John was declaring here that the rightful Messiah that the Jews had been waiting for had arrived. He was there in their midst. The one who was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the prophetic voice to the nations, the eternal high priest, the everlasting king of kings, was already among them, but they did not know him. So John's declaration there is really shaking them up because they knew, the Jews knew, that when the Messiah came, everything would change. So one, of, one thing that we learn, another thing we learn about John's ministry and John's life, really, story, is that being a prophet in the wilderness and speaking truth to power typically leads to poverty and punishment. It is far easier to follow the lucrative trade winds of popular opinion, but withheld honesty results in, fault and in forgotten words. So John the, John the um, apostle, in his, in his description of this, the, the ministry of John the Baptist and its relation to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, is is expressed uh, in this in this first chapter, but he doesn't uh, describe the moment Jesus was baptized by John. Uh, his de his declaration to the Jews, John's de declaration, John the Baptist, his declaration to the Jews indicates that Jesus had already been baptized by John at this at this point. We have to put the synoptic gospel stories together and, and put all these all these pieces together, like four pieces of a puzzle, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to see the whole picture of John the Baptist's ministry and as it relates to Jesus. But we do see that immediately after Jesus was baptized, he went up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so it was significant that John's ministry, uh, which took took place beyond the Jordan, 
uh, on the opposite side of the river from Jerusalem really meant that uh, that he, that that he was obs the, the obscurity or the scrutiny excuse me the scrutiny of the of the religious leaders who would have been particularly interested in what was going on with John and the, and the Messiah that he was that he was away from Jerusalem he was on the other side of the Jordan River from Jerusalem if if John had had uh, had his ministry right there in the heart of Jerusalem it would have drawn too much attention to what he was saying and what he was speaking and preaching and it certainly would have caused a, a much greater a uh, much greater reaction from the Jewish leaders. As we will see when Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he begins to, to confront the, the Jewish leaders there, we, we see what a, uh, what a stir it, it creates with them. So uh, it, it was, you know, it would, would have been one thing for, for John to say that the king is coming, that the Messiah is coming, and so get yourself ready for at some point in the future when the Messiah was, would come. But that's not what he was saying. He's saying that, that the king, the Messiah, was already there. He's already in their midst. And then he was ready to bring to judge all unrighteousness. And so this went far over the line of what the religious leaders were willing to accept. So all of this was really shaking them up. Of course, the fate of John the Baptist was both a warning and an example for Christians who are willing to take the risk of speaking truth uh, to those who have the power to punish him for speaking that truth. Uh, we have John the Baptist was, of course, free to baptize all who came for him for repentance and, and, and cleansing. But when he dared to speak the truth to King Herod for his immoral behavior, uh, and when he called upon Herod to repent, uh, and uh, like with the rest of those who sinned against God, it, it, of course, it led to his, his arrest and eventually to his death. So the Christians will always put their lives on the line when they dare to speak the truth about God's kingdom to the powerful who believe they can do whatever they want for themselves or to others because they control the, the levers of power in, the, in their government, the bureaucracy, the courts, the police, the military, uh, whatever are the engines of the worldly governments and, and those who are in power and control those things, they always be believe that, that they have the, the uh, right to uh, destroy anyone who, who, who speaks against them, anyone who challenges them. The carnally minded ruling classes of, of the totalitarian regime that of every totalitarian regime that ever was or ever will be, um, they will always react with terror and violence, with police force, military force, whatever. They always react with violence when confronted by those who do not fear them. Jesus uh, said to his disciples in Matthew 10, 27 and 28, he said, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light and what you hear in the ear preached on the housetops. And do not fear those who will kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so the, the Jesus encourage us as to be straight to be strong and not to be afraid of those who oppress us in john 1 19 through 28 again uh, as i said we see this is the testimony of john how the the pharisees come and they challenge john they're they're pushing him uh, but John stands firm. He stands uh, stands firm on on what he is preaching, and he tells them, of course, that that the, the Messiah has come. And so, uh, again, we we see in uh, these were reflected in Revelation chapter ten. Revelation chapter ten. Excuse me, chapter two, verse ten. 
In Revelation 2.10, it says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Of course, it's often easy for us who live in the West or us who live in, in relatively free nations uh, to take for granted our ability to worship God as we please, to go to church on Sunday without fear. And, uh, and yet, uh, in many places around the world, and uh, you know, we, we know what's going on in India now, we know what's going on in other countries around the world, and in many places around the world, uh, there's a price to be paid. So the, uh, but God, God says, you know, don't be, don't be moved by that. Remain faithful and, and for God will give us the crown of life. So the day after his exchange with the religious authorities, John the Baptist saw Jesus returning from the wilderness and, uh, and, and Jesus is coming towards him. And, and uh, you know, the apostle John, he did not choose to describe the Lord's wilderness experience at this point, you have to look in the other Gospels to see that, what took place uh, uh, before this moment uh, when he comes back and, and he, he comes back to John. Uh, but in this point, the emphasis of the, of the introduction of this introductory chapter uh, will be upon Jesus uh, as the eternal savior of all creation. And the emphasis, of course, is shifting now and he will begin to uh, introduce uh, the, the, uh, uh, the disciples as the disciples are coming. But we see Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world in, in John chapter 1. That's the primary focus of, of this, the most important part of this first chapter. We see that John bore witness to the crowd that Jesus was the one upon whom the Spirit of heaven came. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is a sign that John had been given to identify the one that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and, and would come with the Holy Spirit to baptize with fire. So John has seen and testified that this is the Son of God. But uh, no one in the crowd was listening to John. Uh, no, no one in the crowd who was listening to John, to John that day as he was describing Jesus no one in the crowd that day uh, left to follow Jesus. Another day passed, and then John was standing with two of his disciples. And seeing Jesus, uh, he again says, you know, behold, uh, behold the Lamb of God, uh, who it comes, uh, behold the Lamb of God. And, and we see in the last 14 verses of this chapter, they describe the, 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 the scene is now shifting to the description of the calling of these first disciples. So you have the introduction of Jesus as, as this uh, changing, uh, great change agent who would come as the light of the world to enlighten and free men. You have the testimony of John the Baptist concerning that. Now you now again it shifts and he begins to, to, to describe the calling of some of the first disciples. And, and how they came from John the Baptist. Two of John the Baptist's disciples heard John call Jesus the Lamb of God, and they went after him. And they came, and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. Now, exactly what Jesus told them that day, remember, they spent the whole day with Jesus. But we are told nothing about what he taught them, nothing about what he said at that time. But uh, only one of the two is actually named, uh, Andrew, Simon Peter, Peter's brother. Uh, we don't know exactly who the second one was, you know, speculation, uh, who that could have been. Uh, but the important thing is that, you know, we can piece together uh, from the Synoptic Gospels, the calling of these disciples, and we can see where, where they're called. But John doesn't want to distract from the main focus of his narrative by giving the details of the calling of every one of his disciples. So in, um, as, as again, as we see the, the chapter is coming to a close here, and <clears throat> John uh, tells us that Andrew was a disciple of the Baptist, and, and Andrew brought his brother Simon. 
uh, called Cephas in Aramaic or Peter in the Greek. Uh, Jesus found Philip and called him to follow. But we are not told where or when. It would not be unreasonable to assume the other disciple of John the Baptist who was, uh, was mentioned in verse 37 was Philip. But, um, uh, but uh, Philip found uh, the skeptical Nathaniel, also named Bartholomew in the Synoptic Gospels, and he brought him to the master. And so from these men, we learn that, uh, you know, sometimes the Lord takes the in initiative and calls someone uh, before they're even seeking him. However, sometimes the Lord waits until the seeker comes looking for him. But in no case does the Lord remain a passive bystander in the calling of the disciples. In other words, people just don't start following them without Jesus acknowledging, either calling them specifically or uh, e either before they're ready or they before they or express uh, wanting to follow him or when they come to him. And, and so we know from, we learn from this that if someone is truly seeking after the truth, the truth that can be found only in him, in Christ, then the Lord is more than willing to meet, meet them halfway. You know, we see in the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, found in Luke chapter 15, uh, in that very same thing, there's the idea uh, in the lost sheep and the lost coin of, of God searching for those who are lost, and yet in the lost son, the father is waiting for the return of the son. So any seeker that draws near to God will hear that still small voice of the Lord asking by the spirit, what do you seek? And the weakness of so-called seeker-friendly churches that we have today is that they tend to draw in those who are seeking something other than the life of true discipleship. You ask them, you know, they're seeking, but what are they seeking? Uh, are they seeking Christ? Are they seeking uh, God or a deeper in a deeper relationship with God? Or, or what are they seeking? Before their master's life on earth was over, every disciple who answered the Lord's call would learn that there is a high, high cost for anyone who seek, forsakes all to follow him. And there is a cost to be paid, but paid if we're going to live without compromise to the truth that he has spoken. And those who, who felt the price was too high, they would abandon Jesus and fall by the wayside. Those who remained would see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so it is today. We, many people are willing to follow Christ as long as there's no cost involved. But to truly follow God and to truly, truly follow the Lord it, it will require uh, a. It will require something. It will require a price to pay, which is which is what we learn from from the uh, from this first uh, gospel or from John's gospel as we go and 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 continue through the chapters in in John's gospel. We will see that Jesus speaks the truth, but the truth that Jesus is speaking always has a, 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 a cost to it, a price to pay. And uh, so this is the gospel that, that uh, John is presenting and how he's presenting it. As I say, in the, in the weeks ahead, we will begin to, to look at all these things, how Jesus was liberating everywhere Jesus is going by his words spoken and, and why, what he was doing in his ministry was liberating people from the fear and the terror and the anger and the oppression, the spiritual oppression, and all of these things that were keeping people in bondage the, by, by speaking truth to power, Jesus was setting people free left and right through all of this. Okay, well, that's the first chapter. And we will now uh, look if anyone has any questions.